While early predictions were that the winter of 2014-15 would see a super El Nino wreaking havoc across the globe, the revised prediction of a smaller El Nino Modoki doesn't mean that the world can rest at ease. Joining us now to detail what needs to be done to improve our preparedness for the coming storms, here's Zafar Adil. He is director of the United Nations University Institute for Water, Environment and Health. And despite the fact it's a UN agency, you work in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, right? I think it's the perfect place to be in. Uh, we're close to the Canadian Center for Inland Waters. McMaster University is our host. Uh, they have a wonderful research program that focuses on water. So I think we're in uh, good company. Good stuff. Tell us just before we look at some of the graphics and understand more about what this is all about, what's El Nino? <laughs> well, El Nino is a phenomenon that happens in the Pacific Ocean. And it's essentially shifting of warm waters towards the east side of the, uh, of the Pacific Ocean. So if you can think of uh, the Pacific Ocean as a tub where warm water usually sits on the west side close to Australia and to Asia, in an El Nino year, that water shifts. And if you can imagine uh, the top tilting uh, in the direction towards uh, South America, that's where the warm water heads. And that means the moisture also shifts uh, in that direction. And typically what we have is that Asia and Pacific side, Australia, uh, have drier weather. And uh, North America and South America have much wetter weather. But I'm perhaps overgeneralizing. That's kind of the trend that you observe in an El Nino year. And, and again, another odd follow-up question, but, but El Nino, I think, is Spanish for a little boy or something like that, isn't it? Why yes. do they call this thing that? <laughs> well, the, the history of it is that in Peru, uh, they had observed a pattern going back about 100 years uh, that every five to 10 years, they would have this nasty weather uh, that affected their fisheries catch. And they would call it the bad boy or El Nino. Oh. So that's how the name uh, took on, and it's been there now for uh, you know, you know, a good few decades. Well, I was going to say, this bad boy in 1997-98 wreaked havoc in um, causing 20,000 deaths, nearly $100 billion in damages. Can you uh, pick those numbers apart a little bit and tell us what's, what's underneath those kinds of statistics? Well, the, the damage was uh, quite significant because of uh, extreme events, and I think Latin America was pretty severely impacted. Uh, that's where most of the deaths were, either due to flooding or landslides uh, or other uh, sort of extreme weather events. There was also droughts in uh, Australia and parts of Asia. There were extreme events uh, as far away as in Bangladesh, uh, where the monsoon was impacted and there were extreme uh, flooding events. So the distribution of that cost was really spread out. And, and there's actually quite a broad range of what the impacts were uh, estimated to be. And that ranges from about 36 billion to about 95 billion. So that's a pretty broad range uh, of uh, what, what we thought the damages were. How prepared and, was the world to deal with El Nino back in the late 90s when this happened? Well, I think starting with around mid-97, uh, there were already uh, headlines in newspapers and in various news media that uh, there was an El Nino coming uh, and that it was possibly going to be a big one. But I think the problem was that in many of the developing countries, uh, they're generally not well prepared. Mm -hmm. And some of the preparedness that has to come from good infrastructure, good information services to the public, good uh, reach out to farmers, uh, that information was not in place. And unfortunately, I think even today, some of that is not in place. So we're not dramatically better prepared today than we were back then? I'm afraid not. And, and I think in many developing countries, the situation is not terribly better than what it was uh, then. I think in some ways, the, some of the institutional responses, particularly, uh, particularly in Central America, seem to be... Uh, uh, better in terms of uh, they have now better forecasting ability where they're able to define what's going to happen in a particular location compared to what was the situation back then. But I think if memory serves, I mean, we're here in October now, and I think it was back in May that we started to hear predictions that we were going to experience, or parts of the world would experience a big El Nino. Is it helpful to make those kinds of predictions that far in advance? Well, in some ways they're helpful, but let me also uh, point out that many of the official channels, for example, the uh, 
National uh, Oceanographic Administration uh, was not actually making that prediction that it's going to be a strong El Nino. So it was many of the researchers who were predicting that it, it may be a big one. And, and now we are s seeing that it may be uh, sort of middle of the, the range type of El Nino event. Middle so, of the range means what? Meaning that it's not going to be as extreme as what we saw in 97, 98, uh, but it will be f still a sizable El Nino. Well, so there's an ENSO index, and at the moment... ENSO it, means what? El Nino Southern Oscillation. Oh, okay. <laughs> ENSO so, index? So it, it's a way of measuring how strong a particular El Nino is. Mm -hmm. um, so now uh, anything above 4 on that index is quite strong. We're probably looking at about 3.4. So it's going to be um, still a sizable event. Um, but, you know, in a way our predictive capability is... Uh, still not as, not as good as we would like it to be. Uh, you know, you want to be able to predict, as you said, back in April or May, and that would give you a six-month window. Uh, but we're actually modifying our predictions all the time uh, as, as newer evidence and information comes in. And what's the latest prediction as to when? Well, I think we're starting to see some warming of the Pacific Ocean already, so, so that's what the predictions are, are based on. Uh, and, and typically, you would think that it's in October that the event would actually start, and you would start seeing uh, some of the early impacts, uh, particularly on the Latin American side. So any day now, you're saying? It should be close, right. Hmm. The new expression that I've seen referring to the more moderate El Nino is El Nino Modoki. What, what does that mean? I'm not actually very familiar with <laughs> with this new terminology, but I, I take it that it's basically saying uh, what I said earlier, that it's going to be a middle-of-the-road kind of uh, a, a El Nino event. So not, not a very... Ex I don't know where the word modoke comes from. Japanese, it sounds like. Maybe, it sounds maybe. like Japanese. Hmm, okay. Uh, has climate change affected the El Nino cycle to the best that you can determine? Well, we have had a chance to look at what the El Nino patterns are over the last, uh, I would say, about a century. Uh, some of the earlier evidence is not very clear. Uh, but from what we see, the overall tendency was the El Nino frequency is between 2 and 10 years. What we've observed uh, since the uh, 70s and early 80s is that the frequency is actually getting shorter. Uh, so they're coming in more frequently. And we've also noted that the magnitude or the uh, level of intensity of the heat uh, difference in the Pacific Ocean is actually getting higher. So you can correlate that to climate change, uh, but again, there's some scientific uh, uncertainty in there in, as to what if that increases uh, directly as a result of uh, global warming and climate change impacts. If they're more frequent but not as intense as the one experienced, whatever it was, 15, 16 years ago, do we infer from that that there w we will see less damage in the world as a result of this? I think the question of damage is something that we looked at quite carefully around the 97, 98 El Nino, and we looked at uh, 16 countries. And what we found was that it's not so much the intensity of the actual extreme climate events, uh, but it's really the uh, level of preparedness and the responses and the state of infrastructure, for example, the state of uh, government agencies' responses to particular uh, events, uh, that's what causes, uh, that's what determines what will be the damage at the end of the day. We are TVO, so let's find out about the impact on O, namely Ontario. Do we need to be worried about this here? Well, generally speaking, uh, what an El Nino year does is that mo uh, weather over most of the uh, southern part of Canada is meant to be wetter than normal. Uh, so that's kind of uh, what you would expect in general. Mm -hmm. But I've not seen any specific predictions about this particular time on what, what we are expected to see. And I think there, therein may be the uh, bit of the issue on how well prepared we are. And I would say that in terms of uh, public awareness and in terms of uh, even, say, the uh, various levels of government responding to it, I think we're and not too well prepared for it. Not too well prepared. Well, we have, obviously, the province of Ontario has an emergency preparedness outfit uh, whose job it is to be up on these kinds of things and know how to respond if and when they happen. Do you think they are seized of this? Are they aware of it? 
I would hope that they are. Um, we, when we looked at uh, the 97-98 El Nino, we didn't look at uh, Canada, but we looked at, uh, as I said, 16 other countries. Mm -hmm. And what we found was that uh, even when there are preparedness uh, uh, you know, in, in place and there are institutions which are normally responding, if they don't have the precise information, uh, the response can be uh, incorrect. So for example, in Costa Rica, uh, there's typically a drought on the northwestern side. So they moved all their cattle to the north central part of the country. But that's actually where the drought hit and they lost thousands of cattle as a result. Uh, so this level of preciseness in uh, getting, a, getting a prediction I think is quite important. Which levels of government do you think ought to be on top of this with presumably new and better procedures and policies in place? Well, I think generally speaking, the government of Ontario has uh, had some, some responses to climate change, generally speaking, in place for a number of years now. Um, and I think most of the responses will also take place at, at that level. But at the same time, uh, Environment Canada uh, is in a position to give us a larger picture uh, which I think is also you, quite useful, uh, and, and they do that all the time. You in the mood for an odd question to finish this off? Go ahead. I, I'm always curious about this because, of course, people in your line of work, you don't want to see anybody hurt, you don't want to see property damaged, you don't want to see disaster befall the world. But, but this is your business, and the worse it is, the more historic it is, you know, you hate to say it, but probably the more interesting it is for you guys. How do you balance that? Well, actually, I would uh, argue quite the opposite, that if we see that governments respond very well, and we've helped them build their capacity as a UN organization in responding to, uh, to these kind of challenges. So a bigger event followed by a reduction in impacts, I think is a big success story for us, and that's what we are hoping for in this case as well. So who are you talking to to make sure that if it is a big event, you get that associated small impact that you are hoping for. I didn't, you, you know I didn't mean to suggest that you're hoping for death and disaster everywhere, but, but a, a big event must be interesting to you as long as there are small consequences associated with it, right? Well, uh, all events are, are of interest, uh, whether they're big or small, and particularly because El Nino is an unusual uh, weather event. Uh, it it uh, triggers quite a lot of interest in various parts of the UN system. Uh, my particular institute is uh, focused more on the policy responses and how governments respond to it. Uh, and, and that's where we are focused on uh, in terms of trying to see uh, whether they're doing well or not well. And that's uh, something that we take, uh, take quite seriously. And in fact, we're now uh, looking at organizing a conference which is called Lessons Learned About Lessons Learned. Hmm. So we put out this uh, policy document uh, back in the year 2001 where we looked at the lessons that were learned from the 97-98 El Nino. So now we want to go back and see whether those lessons have really been learned. And that's really of much more interest to us uh, in how governments are able to respond to uh, the, the major disasters or major events that, that might hmm. take place. Understood. Zafar, good of you to come into TVO tonight and help us out with this. Thanks so much. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Zafar Adil from the United Nations University. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.